here in the book of Hebrews. Let's begin reading together at verse 1. I'll read to verse 4, and we'll get into our study this evening. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. The writer writes, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will." Now, as we begin, the writer has been establishing that Jesus Christ is better. And you know, as I've been taking you through chapter 1, and now that we're in chapter 2, I've been pointing that out, that, that he uses the word better some 13 times through this epistle, and he wants to establish that Jesus is superior. In uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we, we noted now that Jesus is superior to the prophets. In chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, we noted that he stated that Jesus is superior to the angels. Uh, and the reason is because he has a superior name. He's the Son of God. He has a superior position because the angels worship him. He has a superior nature because he is God in the flesh. He has a superior existence because he created all things and predates angels. And he is superior because he has a greater destiny. Everything in creation ultimately bows to worship him. And that's what we saw in chapter 1. In the following verses that we'll be looking at, the writer begins at this point to give us five exhortations. And uh, it would be based on the simple fact that if Jesus Christ is superior, then we need to pay careful attention to the things that we're being taught. That's the point he makes as we begin our study this evening in verse 1. That's the point he's making when he says, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. In other words, it's not simply the hearing it's the hearing and acting upon what we hear that really matters. We have to act upon the things that we hear because when I begin to act on the Word of God, it's going to demonstrate that I truly believe the things that I've been, at least in word, embracing. Uh, James in chapter 1 makes the same point in verses 21 and 22 when he says, "'Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you.'" He goes on to say, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Well, that's what the writer here is saying. He says, give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. So he begins to point that out. You see, everywhere you turn, when you look in the Bible, it very clearly states that when a person comes to a, a saving knowledge of God, that their lives actually change to a degree that people will recognize that, that this person actually does believe. He's not just somebody who, who says, oh, I believe in God. This is a person who actually does. And what happens is when you turn to Christ, you begin to progressively mature in the things of God. You begin to change incrementally over time. The, t the, the changes aren't necessarily uh, of such nature that they're always going to be dramatic. Sometimes they are. You know, some people have been living lives that are, that are so far from God that when they get saved, I mean, it's an immediate, uh, instant, kind of recognizably different kind of life that they're living just because they're different. Uh, and you might not even notice that things are taking place that other people are noticing. I remember when I first got saved, a friend of mine named Bill, who was instrumental in me coming to a, a knowledge of Christ, uh, after I'd been saved for about two, three weeks, uh, Bill was speaking to me on one occasion, and he said to me, you know, he goes, I can tell that you're saved. And I said, how, do you, how can you tell that I'm saved? I'm a brand new Christian. He says, you don't cuss like you used to. And you know, he was right. I mean, I used to like to in invent word combinations just to shock people. I mean, I had a filthy, filthy mouth. I enjoyed swearing. It was a hobby of mine that I refined to a science. It was just something that I did, and I did it to shock people, and I did it quite often. And when I got saved, I began to speak differently to the degree that even Bill noticed almost immediately. And, and that can happen. Your life can change in some ways dramatically. You may have one time been a, a drunk, and, and now you're not drinking anymore. You might have been somebody who does drugs, and you're, you're not doing drugs anymore. It's kind of an instantaneous thing. God has, has set you free. And, and there are m many people, numerous people, who have that kind of testimony that when they got saved, they, they just ceased these activities and all. There are other things that the Lord takes time to work on over time, 
you know, and, and you begin to progressively mature. You begin to become different. But that's all because you got saved. It's because you changed. It's because you want to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even as, as Paul would teach us. It's because we want to live a life that is holy and a life that is blameless. We want to be the kind of people that have been obviously transformed by the power of the grace of God. Um, in 1 Corinthians, in, in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, you might want to turn there. As a matter of fact, let me, let me get you busy turning your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Somebody says, where's 1 Corinthians at? Um, just, just before 2 Corinthians. I know that'll help you. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I want you to read this along with me, not out loud, but as I read, I want you to see this with your own eyes. We no longer are going to be identified with the way that we at one time lived. Our lives, our lives change. In First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, Paul asks the question, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What you once were is not what you are now. You were once like that, but you are no longer like that because you've been changed. I've shared this with you before. Some of you have heard me say this. I was in a, a class and in one of the colleges I attended, and I forget what the class was all about now. It didn't really matter at that time either, I guess. But as I was in that class, it was a secular college, I was speaking to somebody, another student, and, and I remember as we were speaking, he um, began to share with me that he had been an alcoholic and was going to AA, and he said, and I've been sober now for so much, you know, so long a time and all of that. And, and as we were talking, I said, you know, I understand where you're coming from. I said, I, was, uh, I had problems with alcohol myself for five years. And he looked at me, he says, so, he said, once a drunk, always a drunk, huh? And I said, no. I said, I'm not a drunk. He said, well, of course you are. He said, you at one time were an alcoholic, and you still are. You're just on the wagon, you know, and you can fall off at any time. I said, no. I said, I am not a drunk. I said, I at one time was a drunk, and I am no longer a drunk. I said, the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He says, oh, you've had a conversion experience. And I said, absolutely, I've had a conversion experience. I said, I came to, to Jesus Christ, and he's transformed my life. You see, I once was, but I am no longer. I don't identify with that anymore because my life has been transformed. And I believe very strongly that you don't need a 10- or 12-step program. You need a one-step, one step to Jesus Christ. And when you take that step, he transforms your life. And the writer of Hebrews is making that very clear. That's what takes place. As you turn on back to Hebrews, those of you who took the time to find 1 Corinthians, that's what he's speaking about. And so he says in verse 1 again, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, I want to uh, touch on something first that's pretty obvious. Notice how it says here, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed. The question has to be asked, uh, is, he, is he afraid that he's going to drift away from the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the writer saying that it's possible that I'm going to do that? And the answer to that question is no. What he is doing is he is identifying to the reader. He's identifying with his reader. He's basically saying this is something that we together should be aware of. But no, he's not afraid he's going to drift away from the Lord at all. But the bottom line is, is we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful that we remain close to him. You see, if Jesus is superior to the prophets and if Jesus is superior to the angels, then it makes sense to me that I listen to him. That's what he means when he says, let's give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard. Earnest heed simply means uh, to turn your mind completely to something, to be fully attentive. It actually speaks of bringing a ship to the land. What he's saying here is, is we need to not just listen to the gospel, we need to completely embrace it. 
It's not simply hearing the gospel. It's not only hearing it alone. It's hearing it and owning the message. It's hearing it and it's reacting to it. It's hearing it and doing it. And that's the whole point. That's what he's calling us to do, is to hear and to obey. We are not, re we are not saved if we just lukewarmly agree with what is being said. We are not going to be securely fastened to Jesus Christ if that's how we receive it. What we do is we hear it and we embrace it completely. In Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, it says, Take heed to yourself, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. Embrace them in a personal level. Act on them and, and make it so much of a, your life that you communicate these things to your children and your grandchildren. You see, obviously, not every professing Christian is, a, an, is actually saved. There are Christians in name only. They're called nominal Christians. And so nominal Christians need to be exhorted to actually come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Not all seed sown by the sower is going to reach full maturity. And so we give the most earnest heed to the things we hear, lest we drift away. So he's saying, anchor yourselves. Anchor yourself to the Word of God and the promises of life in Jesus Christ. Because if you don't attach yourself to those promises, it's possible that you may drift away. You can be in a, a small ship right next to the, uh, to the, you know, anchored, we'll say, or tied up to the dock, and that rope could slip. And as you're sleeping there on your little boat there, you can imperceptibly begin to drift away. And you can wake up eight hours later miles from the shoreline, you didn't even notice that you were drifting away. So you have to have an earnest concern for those things. Now, as I develop this, I have to ask the question at this point, who is he writing to and who is he exhorting? Well, one, he would be writing to Christians who are not anchored in the Lord. We would call that a, a lukewarm Christian or a backslider. Lukewarm believers are warned by Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. He says, you're not cold and you're not hot. He said, you're lukewarm. He said, and you're in danger of me spewing you out of my mouth. A lukewarm believer is somebody that is not on fire anymore. It's somebody who isn't really red hot for Jesus Christ. Their, their passion for him has been lost. A, a backslider is an individual who is beginning to drift away from the things of God. And the Bible tells us very clearly that's a difficult life. Proverbs 14, 14 says, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And so he's writing first and foremost to, uh, to lukewarm Christians, to people who are just kind of there but not really on fire from him, for him, and, and those who are beginning to actually step away. Believers are challenged to consider whether they are genuine in their faith. You find this in the scriptures. This is one of those challenges. That's why he says we give earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. It's a challenge that he's giving Paul asked the same kind of question. As a matter of fact, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he actually gave them a challenge. To the Corinthian church, he said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Look within yourself and see whether or not you are drifting away. And that's a challenge to every believer, beginning with me and, and for all of us who read the book of Hebrews. Now, how can I test myself to see whether or not I am a saved person? Well, one, I can ask myself a simple question. Do I love the Lord? Am I in love with Jesus Christ or am I ashamed of him? Am I willing to stand up and say, look, it, I believe in Christ and I follow him, or am I the kind of person who's only open with my faith when I'm around people who, who are also Christians? You know, I can tell you how deeply I love the Lord simply by whether I'm willing or not to speak his name in front of people who are not necessarily in love with him. I can tell whether I know the Lord or not when I'm in school and, and the professor is speaking against the gospel and I raise my hand and I defend my faith. I, I can tell that I'm... Uh, uh, on fire for the Lord when I have friends or family members who, who don't appreciate uh, my faith in Jesus Christ, and, and rather than me backing down from them or being afraid that they're going to reject me, uh, I, I stand up and I make a defense of what I believe. You know, when I first got saved, I learned to do that. I had an aunt who, uh, who was a very, very strong Catholic woman, my Aunt Julia, and I hadn't been saved more than two weeks when my aunt came to visit and she was a very, very strong Catholic lady and all of that. And I can still remember her coming over and, and sitting down in the couch there. And she was the older sister. And uh, 
you know, she's very devout. We used to call her the, the nun. <clears throat> she was very, very devout. And uh, she said, so, she said, so what's going on, David, in your life now? And I looked at her and I said, I'm a Christian now, Aunt Julia. And boy, she got, she was not happy about that, you know. We're all Christians, she goes. And, and I started, uh, I was going to argue with my aunt, you know, and my mom walked in right when that beautiful experience was about to happen. And mama gave me that look like, don't do it, please don't do it. You know, she's an old woman, she'll have a heart attack or something, please don't do it. But, you know, I, I just, when I got saved, I, I figured that, well, listen, if, if, if the message is that important and if it really transformed my life, then how selfish am I if I don't tell other people about it? You see, the most selfish person in the world is the one who goes to heaven alone. So God has called us to have a relationship with him and to express that to others. So I ask you the question, you want to test yourself if Christ is in you or not? Do you love him? Do you love him? Are you willing to be identified with him? Are you willing to speak about him? Are you open to that? Or are you hiding? That'll help you to understand something about yourself. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? Is there a growing longing within yourself to be like him? Do you desire him more than anything else? The psalmist in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2 said it this way, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? Paul said it like this in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As a deer longs for water, I have come to recognize that my soul is longing for God. Is that part of your life? Is, is that where you're moving towards? I'm not saying that that you're actually there or that you'll arrive on this side of heaven. You won't. But is that part of your life? Is that how you are? Do you wake up in the morning and, 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 and pray and say, God, this is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to serve you today. I know I'm going to have difficulties. I know that there's going to be opposition. I know the world's coming against me. I know my flesh is going to come against me. I know there's a variety of things I'm going to deal with. So I want to begin this day first and foremost by committing it to you. That basically is what I do, and that's the truth every morning as I wake up, and I, you know, I'm in a groggy kind of fog and all of that, but I will, I'll lay there, and, and the first thing that comes to my mind is normally a song and, and then a prayer, and that's what I do. And, and the first thing I do in the morning is I pick up a devotional, very first thing, and I'll read the devotion for the day, and that's how I begin because I know the enemy's after me. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I want to be faithful to God, and so I begin my day like that every day that the Lord might work within me. Then I climb in the car and I drive to work and I'll come here to the church. And as I drive here, I'll turn on my radio. I listen to Christian music so I can saturate my spirit with the joy of the Lord and the songs that edify and build me up. And that's what I do. And then I come in here. Then I have an opportunity to study the Word of God all day long. And then I go home and backslide because I've got a carnal wife. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, of course. Of course, she's the joy of my heart. But... I realize that my flesh is always ready to have ascendancy. I know that. I know it's easy. Backsliding is just a guy cutting you off in traffic away. He's just that close. It is there. Your flesh is always ready to be given vent. And so I know that. And so I'm constantly saying, God, I just want to be with you and like you. And so that's a key. Do you have an appreciation for the Word of God? Do you have a hunger for the things of God? Do you read the Bible? Do you desire to obey what it says? Are these things that matter to you? Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And so from my perspective, Lord, I want to read and I want to obey. I want to know your Word by putting it into practice. And so He's writing first and foremost to, to lukewarm Christians or perhaps even backsliders, and he's saying you need to be careful. You need to take heed, an earnest heed to the things you've heard lest you drift away. And then secondly, and this is interesting, he's writing to those who have yet to fully embrace the gospel. In every church service, services just like this, in every church service, you will have somebody who is in church, who has not yet fully committed themselves to Jesus Christ. Sometimes they're called pre-Christian. Sometimes they're called pagans. But they're people who have not embraced the Lord. They're just not Christian. They'll go to the church and they'll listen, but they're not yet saved. You know, and they do come to church. In our fellowship, we have numerous individuals who, who come here 
and, and are not saved. And, and over the years, I've seen it more than once where somebody actually has been in church for weeks into the months, and then they answer an invitation and, and, and get saved, even though they've been a member in the sense of being part of the fellowship and, and appearing here on Sunday mornings and sometimes in evening services. And, and then they come forward, and, and then later on, I'll speak to them. I remember one individual who said to me that. He said exactly that. He goes, I was in the church for a year until I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I thought, anybody who can put up with me for a year has got to be saved. You're exercising great patience in doing that. That is a Christian virtue. How can you be there for a year and not know the Lord? But he said, listen, I was there for a year until I finally realized that I had never embraced Christ. I have a very strong belief that people will go to church sometimes, hear a message, but never embrace it. There are people who are raised in church, and, and even in this church, and, and they apathetically agree in principle to the things that they're hearing. But they've never really thought too deeply about their faith and what it's supposed to be. They consider themselves Christian because that's all they really have ever known. They believe themselves to be saved because they think they believe what they believe. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, said something. We looked at it recently, but let me read it to you. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are numerous people who have uh, listened to partial gospel messages or messages that didn't really contain uh, a need for repentance and conversion who might have come forward at an invitation, at that invitation, thinking themselves to become Christian when in reality what they did is they heard something that really didn't convince them that they needed to turn away from their sin and embrace Christ. They heard something that made them feel that they needed a change in their life and they'd give God a try. There are numerous people like that. I've seen them over the years. In reality, we ultimately consistently do what we actually believe because our beliefs will always be expressed through our behavior. So I can say that I believe certain things, and I can say it all day long. That's called a head faith or a said faith. But what God wants me to have is a heart faith, something that has transformed me from within. And so when he's writing here, he can be, one, writing to a lukewarm Christian, a Christian who is backslidden, and two, he can be writing to people who are reading this and hearing this read in a church service who have yet to commit themselves to Jesus Christ. You see, what you believe is what you do. And so people can, can tell you all day long that they're Christians, but if their lives do not demonstrate a transformed life, if they're not moving towards the things of God for a consistent period of time, then it very well may be that they, they don't know the Lord. Now, I can speak for myself as a testimony, and I think the rest of you have something that you could probably say that may be similar. There have been periods of my life when if you'd have seen me, you wouldn't have thought I was a Christian because I was backslidden, you know, because I was doing things I shouldn't do. And you could have seen me in that condition and undoubtedly could have thought, I better witness to this guy because he doesn't know God. And, and that's the truth. But within me, uh, I had a, a faith in Christ. I was not living at that time. And I had people witness to, to me before, and, and I tried to convince them that I am a Christian. Unfortunately, I was drunk at the time, and so I wasn't able to convince them that I was a Christian. In reality, I was, but I was backslidden, and, uh, and it brought me to great grief in my heart, and, and I repented and turned back to the Lord, and my life was changed. So there are periods of your, of your life and times in your life that you may not be walking solidly with Him, but there's something within you that just can't find pleasure and joy outside of the grace of God. And, and, and you sense the reality of that, and you return to Him. And that's a person who's been born again. But there are others who, who sin without a, a single thought of conscience. It doesn't matter to them whatsoever that they're doing things that are wrong. They may go to church, but it doesn't really bother them what they're doing in all of that. Because in reality, they, they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And consistently over time, it's demonstrated by the way that they live. Proverbs 20, verse 11 says, Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. And so your behavior over time demonstrates what you believe. So we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Let's rush to verse 2. Four. If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? 
And so remember, as he's speaking, that he's speaking to a group of people who knew that the law had been somehow communicated through angels and was binding. Notice verse 2 how he says, if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast. And so Jews believed that the law was communicated through angels and was binding in their life. Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 says, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. And they believed that that was the giving of the law. Uh, Stephen, uh, just before he was martyred, made reference to that belief when he said in Acts 7.53, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. And Paul in Galatians 3.19, speaking of that also, said the law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. And so he's speaking concerning the law that was given, and he says every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. The law was so strict that it would tolerate no offense, and it prescribed punishment for every transgression. In the Old Testament, if you break a law, you're held guilty of breaking that law, but not just that law, but all the law. If you break the law in one point, you are guilty of the whole law because the law calls for, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses calls for complete faithful obedience. And so if I am not perfect, if I don't live according to every jot and tittle of the law, if I break it and I do, then it's not just the one law that I break, it's the whole thing because the law is spiritual and I'm carnal, sold into sin. Jesus made it very clear that adultery was not simply the, the physical act. It, it was the, the act of the heart. He, he said that murder isn't simply going out and killing somebody physically. It's, it's murdering them within. It's from within. It all begins from the inside. And so the point he was making is that the law is not simply me outwardly appearing like I'm keeping it when my heart is far from him. In obedience to the law, my life is actually transformed because I'm holding fast to that law. Bottom line is, is I can't do that perfectly, therefore I need help, and that's how it's pointed out. And so if I break the law, there was a just punishment for it. If I did a minor offense, there's going to be an offering made, but if I did a major offense like, like murder, there is a capital offense, and therefore there's a just punishment for it. And so he's pointing that out. He's saying, listen, the law was given and transgressions had uh, uh, punishments that actually fit the crime. So if that's under the law, verse 3, then how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which was at first begun to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? If the law is that severe, then what's going to happen if I reject Jesus Christ? If the law is so severe that there was a just punishment for every infraction, then what's going to happen if I reject the Lord, Jesus himself? How can, I, how can I escape if I neglect so great a salvation? And so, if I neglect this, to neglect speaks of reducing or making light of it, not regarding it for what it is. If I neglect the Word of God, if, if I say it's no big deal, there's no salvation for me, and that's what the writer is saying here. You know, I think sometimes over the years, and I've heard this more than once, when I've spoken to people on a personal level and I've said to them, do you want to pray and receive Christ? And they say, well, I'll hear you some other time. It really grieves my heart because they're having an opportunity at that moment to receive the gift of eternal life. And I've discovered something. The longer you put it off, the more difficult it is later on to open yourself up. It's not difficult to raise a child up to believe in certain things about God at all. I discovered that to be true with my own children. We poured into them the Word of God and prayer from the time they were small. Yes, there were seasons in their life that they rejected the things that we tried to teach them, and there were times when, when I wasn't quite sure whether or not they, they had a saving knowledge of God at all by the way that they would act sometimes. That's the truth. But I knew that by pouring into them, I was giving to them a conscience. I was establishing a moral compass within them. I knew that that, that if, I, if I train up a child in the way he should go when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I did that from the time my children were small, when they were babies, and they would be inside of their, uh, you know, as we were feeding them, they're sitting inside of their, uh, whatever that thing, their high chair. Uh, and, and I would take them by the hand, and I'd say, let's pray and thank God for our food. I mean, from the very beginning, when they were little kids, four years old, three years, and two years old, I can still remember having family devotions with them where they would sit in the front room, and, and I'd have them seated in front of me, and Marie would be seated next to me, and we'd open up a book, and I'd read to them, and I'd pray with them. The whole devotion only took five minutes. They couldn't listen much longer than that, and I'd take an offering and then send them to bed. Uh, I, can, I can remember that. 
How many of you want to get saved? Oh, I see that little hand. You know, I, I can remember doing that very often, you know, and they'd crawl up to the altar and get saved every week. But I, I can remember doing that with the babies, you know, pouring into them the things of God so that as they grew older, they would be sinning against the light. As they grew older, they would know this is not right for me to do because my father has taught me otherwise, and the Bible says such and so. I knew that. And so I poured my life into my children in that way because I knew that I was preparing them for life, a life that they would be living ultimately outside of, of my oversight. And so I wanted them to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, there is a message they must embrace in order to be saved. I am not a lukewarm believer, and I certainly wasn't one in my home. I wanted them to know that Jesus Christ is everything to them and needs to be, that they need to pursue him because I want them to be able to take the things that their father and mother gave to them and give it to their own children. That's what I wanted. And I knew that it was going to break a chain if I wasn't there strongly holding fast to those things and pouring into them. I did not want to disregard or neglect the things of God. I didn't want to do that. I still don't. And I didn't want them to either. So if we neglect so great a salvation... How can we do that? How, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You see, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Or 1 Timothy 1.15, where Paul says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Or Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. That's what we do. We do not neglect it. We do not neglect the message of the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. We embrace it, and we live it, and we live it faithfully. Now, he goes on to say in verse 3 uh, that it was at first, it at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed uh, to us by those who heard him. And so when it says this, this message of salvation, it's in reference to the gospel, the message that Jesus Christ gave. And so when you read the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read what Jesus taught, that's what he's referring to. He's saying this message that has been recorded, the message of Jesus Christ that has been recorded was given faithfully for the three years that he ministered, and then he ultimately died. Now, as he was ministering for these three years, he began to pour into his apostles, those 12 men whom he had designated apostles, he poured into them all that God had poured into him, and he gave to them this message. And so, when Jesus Christ mentored these men, and it must have been an incredible experience, by the way, to have been mentored by Jesus himself. Can you imagine what that would have been like? To be able to be there at a campfire next to a lake, eating fish, and listening to the Lord Jesus Christ as he would speak to them concerning the wonders of heaven. Can you imagine what that would have been like? As you were there with him, asking him questions. What kind of questions do you have now? Well, could you imagine if you had those questions and you would speak to him face to face, that there you are next to him? Or if you had such a close relationship like the Apostle John that you could actually lean against him and you could hear the heartbeat of God and you could look up at him and you could say, Master, I've been wondering about this. Can you explain this to me and help me with it? What an incredible experience that must have been. And for the Lord Jesus Christ to say, listen, I have poured into you everything I know, and I'm giving you the Spirit, and I want you to go out, and I want you to take this message to the four corners of the world, and I want you to proclaim it to every living creature. Now, you're not going to be able to do that in an, uh, of your own strength because, well, Peter, as I consider what you have been like, you have, you have made some strong statements in the past so that you would even die for me and all, but ultimately you, you, you weakened in that resolve and, and you denied that you knew me and, and I had to restore you. So, so, Peter, you remember how your heart was so greatly turned towards me and you desired so much to be faithful, but you were unable to be? Well, Peter, I want to do something to help you in this. I'm going to give to you the power of my Holy Spirit and I'm going to pour the Spirit upon you. And you're going to be a witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so this man, Peter, and the others who forsook him and fled, denied basically that they knew him, became the carriers of a message throughout the world as they knew it. How did that happen? Through God and God's power. I've discovered something. 
Well, let me read verse 4. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I've discovered something. God can take even the most shy individual and transform them into a courageous warrior. I have discovered that. That God can take people who are exceptionally quiet, who really have little to say normally, and transform them into eloquent communicators of his message. I have seen that happen. I have seen God take people who, who really are unqualified in many ways. I mean, I, I think of my friends, to be honest with you. Uh, I think of people like, like my friend Bob Grenier, uh, who celebrated 28 years of pastoring his church in Visalia recently, and, and, and Bob got saved um, in, in Florida back in 1973, and it was in an airport in Miami. As a matter of fact, he and I have been in the airport in the spot that he got saved in, and he shared his testimony with me right there. He said, this is where I was when somebody walked up to me, gave me a track, and shared with me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And three days later, he said, I was on my way into North Carolina to join a ministry, uh, to be part of that ministry, and never walked away from the Lord and been serving him ever since. But you, you meet Bob, if you see Bob here in my pulpit, he is a sweet man, love him, he's one of my very dearest and closest friends. Bob used to carry a 45, he used to run drugs, he was a pilot, he used to go into South America and he used to pick up cocaine and bring it back and sell it on the streets. You wouldn't know that if you looked at Bob, you wouldn't know that at all. I mean, I can start talking about a lot of guys that you know very well, guys like Steve Mays who got shot and had a bullet wound in his, in his body laying in a gutter and... And, and coming to Christ because some little Weasley guy walked up and said, you, need, you look like you need God. You pray and you get saved right now. And he did. You know, violent men, we all know the testimony of Pastor Rawl. And, and men like Mike McIntosh who, who thought that half of his head was blown off and it was just an accident of, accident of nature that he could still continue to, to function in any way because he knew that half of his head had been blown off through somebody placing a revolver next to his head and blowing his head off. And now he's pastoring a, a magnificent work and has been for many years there in San Diego. And you can go on and on and on and you can talk about guys who at one time were anything but pastoral material. Anything but that. You know, I, you know I, I graduated from high school with a D minus average. The only books that I ever read were comic books, you know, and, and, and here I am, you know, opening a Bible and studying. I mean, the two things I hated more than anything was studying and speaking in front of people. And that's what I do. You know, it amazes me. And a lot of people, like myself, are extremely shy. Some of you know that through experience. I mean, you'll see me someplace and and you'll walk up to me and you'll discover that what I am behind the pulpit may be alive, but when I am just out there in public, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of quiet, you know, and God has been very gracious because he gave to me Marie, who, who will um, become your best friend in about three minutes, you know, and so God has been very gracious to me. I've told you this about her. She's such a blessing in my life, but that's how she is, and God placed us together because he took a shy person and somebody who's very open and warm and placed us together so that that I could become a better person. I mean, I've been with my wife in so many places. Let me share one thing with you about her and just to show you how I, what I'm trying to, to say here. We were on a plane, and as we're on a plane flying back from Israel, she's seated next to a woman. She always sits next to the passengers in the seats with us, and this was a stranger. I'd never seen this woman before, so we're just seated next to her, and as, as I'm sitting there, and Marie's here, and then the lady is next to Marie over here on her left, as we're sitting there, I'm asking myself a question. This happened a few years, several years ago now, but I'm asking myself a question. This is the truth. I'm asking myself, I wonder how long it's going to be until Marie and she are talking and crying. <laughs> I mean, she's good. the lady's going to tell her her whole life story. Uh, when, when is this going to happen? I, I wonder how long. I almost want to time it because I know within, within a couple minutes she's going to be visiting. So Marie turns and, and speaks to the woman. True story turns and speaks to the woman, and the woman speaks in Hebrew back to Marie, and in broken English says, I, 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 I do not speak English. And I thought, oh, great, mega challenge. Let's see, <laughs> let's see, because I know Marie cannot travel for hours next to a person without, oh, she's going to die. And I thought, how is this going to happen that she's going to be able to talk? I know she's going to talk to this woman. I know she'll find a way. And I watch my wife in her a little her forehead kind of furrows for a minute, and I know she's, she speaks Spanish to the woman. The woman speaks Spanish because she's from Spain. For the next nine hours, they're talking for the whole trip. 
Marie helps her through the airport, gets her to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, true story, in Los Angeles, the woman is crying, Marie is crying, the woman's kissing me on the face, kissing all of my children. She became my grandmother overnight. An amazing thing. But God has a way of taking us with his gifts and transforming us and by his Holy Spirit. Now, you may be a very shy person. You know, join the club. You may be a very quiet to yourself person. But I've discovered something. I've discovered that when God's Holy Spirit works in you, when God begins to transform you, and when God begins to gift you, then that, that, that quietness that you have and that shyness is lost in the moment of opportunity that God gives to you to share about Jesus Christ. And for me, I discovered my call a long time ago by going to secular college. And I would be seated in the class, and I'd be waiting for somebody to say something because the teacher was saying something nonsensical, and nobody would, would address it, nobody would say anything, and I'd take a deep breath, and I'd raise my hand, and I'd say, you know, there's another way to look at that, and I would share my, my faith with the class. I did it often. And I discovered that when God is for you, who can be against you? And I discovered that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do things because he always gives to you the victory, a continuous conquering through Christ. You discover that, though, by opening your mouth because the Lord says, open your mouth and I will fill it. And there are times when it's the spirit of, of, of your father, Jesus said, who will speak through you. And so you just say, Lord, I want to be used by you and I want you to somehow use me in this capacity. So the gospel began to be spoken by Jesus Christ. It was continued through his apostles and continues even to this day. And God was working along with them. God was confirming by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts his word. So as the message was presented, God often validated that message by working. In, in Mark 16, 20, it says, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. That's what God does. So you have Peter and you have John. It's the hour of prayer. They're at the beautiful gate. They're about to walk in. A man who is crippled is there at the gate. As Peter walks by him, he looks down at this man. Undoubtedly, this man had been there for a long time. Undoubtedly, he had been there during the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus would have walked past him several times because he was, he was basically stationed there. That was a place that he would beg and, and receive help from the, uh, the pilgrims and, and the religious people who would enter into the temple and all. And here comes Peter and here comes John. It's the hour of prayer. And Peter, looking down at the man, says, look at us. And the man looks up at him, expecting to receive something, the Scripture says. And then Peter says to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. And the Bible says that Peter, reaching down, took him by the hand and lifted him up. And as he began to lift this man to his feet, that he received strength in his ankles and his legs, he got an immediate healing, he had equilibrium, equilibrium, he was able to walk, he was able to leap, he began to praise God. He began to hold on to the apostles, and as he did so, the people began to crowd around this amazing miracle that had taken place. And, and Peter, who had not that long before denied knowing the Lord, a man who had denied Jesus three times stands there and begins to preach. Men of Israel, why do you look so intently at us as if through our own goodness we made this man capable of walking? He says, I want you to know something. It's in the name of Jesus, the man whom you, by the way, took and crucified. Well, it's through his name and faith in his name that this man has been made every whit whole before you today. How'd that happen? A man who denied the Lord Jesus Christ to a young woman who said he was also with him. A man who three times said, I don't know him, even cursed himself, brought curses upon himself. How did that happen? It happens through God working through you. That's how it happens. Why can't God use you? Why can't he? What kind of list have you made in your mind that disqualifies you? Why well, can't speak? Well, Moses said that. But God said, who made your mouth? God has an ability to use you if you're open. I wonder sometimes how many people in this church are called by God to be used magnificently who just simply never take him up on his promises. I wonder. I wonder how many churches can be birthed from this one church by men who knew God's call in their life and took a chance and just stepped out in faith to see what God wanted to do today. 
I wonder how many of your friends and, and relatives are, are, are waiting to, to just hear the truth and, and are looking to you because they know you're a believer and are wondering, when are you going to tell me what you believe? I was in a church service. The invitation was given. The Holy Spirit prompted my heart. My cousin was seated next to me. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, tell him you'll go forward with him at this invitation. I want to save him. I remember that very well. And I remember as I was seated there, uh, arguing with his inner voice and saying, no, no, I'm not, no, not going to do that. Because if I go forward with him, the people are going to think I'm getting saved and I've already been saved for three years. So no, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, I think that's just my imagination. I'm not going to do that. And I heard the prompting of the Spirit. He, he didn't stop. He said, ask him to go with you. I want to save him today. And I said, no. And so we went home after church, and my cousin is seated across the dinner table from me, and we're eating lunch. And you know what he tells me? My cousin Ray, he looks at me and he says, you know, David, when that inv invitation came today, I thought you were going to ask me to go forward because I wanted to get saved today. He did get saved. We prayed. But I, I've never forgotten that, obviously. That was 32, 33 years ago. I still haven't forgotten that. I wonder how many opportunities we quench the Spirit in where God has divinely opened an opportunity to us, but we're saying, uh, I don't know. So ask yourself that question. Just ask him this question. This is a question I ask myself, and I'll ask you to ask yourself the same thing. Why not me? Why not me? Why can't God use me? Why? And ask yourself that, because the answer is, he can if you're saved. He will if you're saved. So why not today? Why not leave today and say, God, here am I. Use me. What do you want to do? Life can be a tremendous adventure when you're serving the Lord.